Yeah, I think probably by the end of I've got a little slideshow with some visuals and by the end of that, I think it'll be pretty clear that this is not something that I'm just making up or, mm, yeah. or dreaming up. Because like I said, I was resistant to it at first, but the evidence is overwhelming. I mean, there's so much evidence. Um, but like I said, it's not what we've been taught. It's it's um, we've been taught that these things are were originally intended to be understood literally and and that's really not true. I think I'll show you some examples that may may drive that home. But, um, you know, I think these ancient myths were given to all people, not to separate us, but to, to help us because they have information that we need, but they've been used to separate us. So this is one of my favorite uh, pieces of ancient artwork. From what culture do you think that would be? Um, what does it look like Greek or something? Yeah, so that's ancient Greece. Do you have any idea what is being depicted in this scene? Uh, it's not a I could see an archer. Yeah. So it's, it's like... actually a goddess. Okay. You know, which goddess would be an archer in ancient mm, Greece? Goddess of war something. I forget. Yeah, her it's name. actually the goddess Artemis. So she's not Artemis. really a she's not really a war goddess. Athena's more of a war goddess than Artemis. But the goddess Artemis is a very, very important goddess. And she's the twin sister of the god Apollo. Apollo and Artemis are twins. And one day she was taking a bath in a, in the, in a grotto in the woods, in a pool, a, a beautiful little place where the river kind of flowed down and made a pool there. And she was with her attendant nymphs. She was bathing in the water there in the secluded forest. And there was a young hunter named Acteon. He was a prince. He'd been hunting all day, he'd been out with his hunting hounds. He, you know, his hounds had chased down some deers and then they shot the deers and they, and they were drying out all the hunting gear and the nets and things. And, you know, they'd skin the deer. And he said, oh, hey, I'm gonna take a little break and go for a walk in the woods, get away from, you know, I'm, I'm all tired out from hunting. And he unfortunately happened to cross the goddess Artemis and her nymphs as they were bathing. And that was not a good day for him because she, you know, became infuriated that he was staring at her. He couldn't take his eyes off her, of course, because she's a goddess and she's in the, you know, bathing. And she got angry at him and splashed water on him and said, uh, you know, what, you can't say anything? You're looking at a goddess. Why are you just standing there? And she splashes water on him. And he turns, starts to turn into a deer. Yeah, have you ever heard that story? No. Yeah, he turns into a deer. Now, this artist hasn't decided to portray him as a deer. But then what happens is, of course, he starts to panic, but he tries to talk and he can't talk. He doesn't know why he's just running because he's turned into a deer. But he can still realize, you know, he still has his own mind, but he's also turned into a deer. And then, of course, his hunting hounds catch the scent of a deer, a stag, and they start running after him and he's trying to tell him, hey, it's me, but he can't talk because he's a deer, and they tear him to pieces. And that's uh, that's what happens if you step over the boundaries. Artemis is very big on keeping the boundaries, and she's a protector of women, in fact. She's present at all childbirth in ancient Greece. So anytime a baby is born, Artemis is present. Um, so she would be very um, upset at the statistic that we have 16% of the you know, women in America are taking antidepressants, probably more that are depressed. There's something wrong. She would be you know, angry about that. She's a protector of women and of boundaries. She's a very severe goddess. She's a virgin goddess. Um, so, and that's, there, there's all kinds of significance to all these things. But this uh, painting, when I first saw it, I said, you know, I was flabbergasted when I first saw this, um, in a in a volume of ancient pottery um, that was written in the early 1900s like 1906 later i got a chance to go see it you can see this in the museum of fine art in boston it's a very large uh, crater it's called it's like a bell crater it has two handles on either side it's like as big as your chest almost mm -hmm. or like if you were holding it with the two handles it'd be like you know almost as wide as your shoulders um but when I first saw this picture, I realized this is, this ancient artist has depicted it, depicted this scene in yeah. 
the outlines of these constellations. You mentioned earlier, you know, the, the constellation Hercules. We'll get to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. And it's not really a baby that's right in front of, of him. That's something that I'm arguing. There's a constellation right in front of Hercules that appears as a baby in all these myths around the world, including the Solomon story oh. that you alluded to. Um, it's really clear that it is, but it's not something you would expect. This constellation is not called the baby that's in front of Hercules. And the same thing, the constellation Sagittarius, the outlines, you won't see this particular way of outlining Sagittarius unless you happen to read H.A. Ray, who in 1952 wrote this book, The Stars, A New Way to See Them. Well, I don't know if he was just a genius or if he he was in touch with the gods or his higher self, or if he was um, the recipient of some ancient secret tradition that had been passed down through the centuries. But the outlines that he was outlining happened to match right up. You can see this again and again. His outlines are the outlines that help you see these, these um, connections to the myths. It's not just in the artwork. We'll see that it's it's in the stories as well. But this ancient artist, look at how he's depicted the goddess Artemis there. Look at the angle of her legs. Look at yeah. the, uh, the length of her dress. Yeah, it's not a natural formation or stance. It's rather like an interpretation almost or, yeah. Look at the, look at the constellation again. This is the outline. Look right. at how she's holding the bow. Look at how the constellation is holding the bow. Yeah. It's not held up to her cheek. Orion is also sometimes depicted with a bow. When when the when the pattern matches up with Orion, the bow is held in a very different way. This is the way a Sagittarius figure holds the bow. And then you can even see, look at the length of her dress um, in the in the ancient artwork. Look at the look at the um, whatever she has over her shoulder, I think it's like a quiver. It could be like a samurai sword. I don't think yeah, it's it a looks samurai like sword. Or. Yeah. <laughs> but mm -hmm. I think it's a quiver with a tassel or something on it. But why did the artist put that there? Because look at the constellation. Yeah, you there's see something that? there. Yeah. Above the head, this is, these are distinctive features of the constellation Sagittarius that will appear in different myths. Not always in artwork, but in the myths, you will have these patterns. And then Sagittarius is right across the Milky Way from Scorpio. Well, look at the angle of Scorpio. Look at the angle of the uh, art, artistic per portrayal of Acteon. And he's being a torn apart by these hounds with their little curly tails sticking up in the air. Look yeah. at Scorpio. There is no doubt in my mind that this ancient artist understood that the goddess Artemis connects up with Sagittarius. Mm. And... You see the Milky Way there? This this is the widest, brightest part of the Milky Way. This yeah. is up in the summer. That's the pool that she was bathing in. That's that's oh, okay. there are so many myths where there is a, a goddess bathing in a pool or in a grotto, or sometimes it's a princess, right. like in the Odyssey. Um Nausicaa comes she's the princess of um of Phi 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 Um she comes down to the pool with her with her servants or her friends to do they're doing the laundry down at the river bank and that's where odysseus stumbles across him he's like what's going on i hear i hear voices it's the same pattern over and over and these are constellations they match up with constellations and they appear in myths around the world again and again so um let me just move yeah on. one one quick yeah. question i had so when when an artist is um making a piece like that, what do you think, I mean, of course, at various times in history, I'm sure it's differing, but for what audience is he or she putting that message in? We call this esoteric knowledge and that, but doesn't esoteric mean sort of hidden knowledge for a select few or a few that would understand it? But I find it confusing that wouldn't an artist want to depict this and have it be very obvious, or is there a purpose to having it hidden or secret? Yeah. Is that, is that a, opening up another can of worms? It, it's a great question. It yeah. definitely opens up a can of, uh, it, it opens up a, a can of uh, Scorpio, <laughs> <laughs> right? There's the, uh, Scorpio does sometimes appear as a bunch of worms or maggots actually in, in oh. some myths. Um, let me, let me address that question because yeah. it's an important, 
because it's an important quote. Okay. I've right. got plenty of time uh, if you need to go a little okay. longer too. That's fine. Great. So this is um, so this is a qu quotation from Plutarch about the veil of Isis. It cannot be uncovered by any mortal. And it's very, uh, it's a very serious accusation to say, oh, you're giving away these esoteric secrets. Um, but I think that actually what Plutarch means is that you can't actually give them away to somebody else. And I'm, I'm quoting, actually, I've got a quote right here from a Alsatian esoterist named Schwaller de Lubitz, um, R.A. Schwaller de Lubitz. He lived from 1887 to 1961. But he says, esoteric teaching is strictly evocation and can be nothing other than that. It's, what does evocation mean? It's calling something out. It means right. it's, you already have it inside of you. Okay, yeah. I have to, I can't, I can't, you've got to grasp it yourself. So he can't, the, art, the, the artist cannot put a little footnote at the bottom of the pottery that says, this is Sagittarius shooting, the, like explaining. Well, yeah, so there was, there was obviously this system that's been preserved for hundreds of years because we can find Renaissance artists using the same system. So how did that happen? I'm not sure that they knew the connection to the stars. They may have just been taught, you know, oh, the, right. okay. the, the schools of artistry might have been, well, when we depict... The Virgin Mary, we have to have her arm right. out like this. It doesn't right. mean that they were told it's because it connects up with a constellation. Uh, Maybe they right. were told. I don't know. Yeah, but it may good. have just been the conventions that were passed down. Right, Somebody right. knew it, but not necessarily the artist. Or maybe the artist knew it. I don't know. But the connection to the stars is in order to cause an evocation. I use the, the example of daniel San and Mr. Miyagi. Mr. Miyagi was trying to teach Daniel-san, but he wasn't trying to hide karate from Daniel-san, was he? he? He knew that Daniel-san needed karate because he was getting beat up by these other kids at school, right? Yeah. But he started teaching him using wax on, wax off and paint the fence and sand the deck. Why? To, to trick him? To hide it from him? To say, you know, I don't really want you to know karate. I want you to wax all these cars. No. Because he, he had to make Daniel grasp it f from within himself. With the invocation. He, the, oh. Right. The light had to come on. If he just started to show him from the outside, it's – so remember what I was saying at the beginning about um, the reconnection with the self. Well, who can reconnect you? If you've been disconnected from yourself, who can reconnect you with yourself, Derek? Right. Right. Me? Can I, can I reconnect you with yourself? Don't think so. No, nobody can, but except for self. you, you're the only one yourself, yourself that, uh, that you were disconnected from, if you were disconnected from yourself. And I think we all were to some degree or another. I mean, to the fact that we like when we go into a social setting, have to think about, Oh, how should I act or what? That's like a separation from yourself. If we were like just totally like there are people who are so integrated with themselves and so um, it just flows like they just. Yeah, everything they're just themselves. They're not putting on an act. Mm -hmm. they, they, they don't have to worry to the extent that you feel anxiety. <laughs> it's because you're not completely connected with yourself, but you can get more and more connected with yourself, but no one else can do it for you. Only you can go in there deep in there and the myths i think are depicting that for us so when i tell you that maybe i just gave away a big secret but it really i didn't give away anything because you still have to do it i still have to do it right. it's 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 impossible it, it, really it to reminds give me of the krishnamurti teaching the truth is a pathless land and that he would talk about nobody can show you the the light you have to be the light to yourself and that kind of concept yeah so yeah. that's right it, nobody can and actually, um, there's an author I like named Peter Kingsley who uh, says, you know, we always talk about the light, finding the light, getting enlightened. Oh, that guy's enlightened or that woman's enlightened. Mm. And actually, he says the path is actually, if you look at the ancient myths and the ancient poets and the ancient philosophers, 
is a path through darkness. You have to go down through the darkness. It's not through the light. Right, right. It's actually deep inside of you. The Buddha yeah. is meditating inside of a crack in the rock. Well, that's the Buddha is inside of it's actually he's not an external person that you got to try and be like. It's talking about getting in touch with yourself, I would argue. But anyway, so I'm arguing that these myths are actually about us. And if they're metaphorical, then that helps to strengthen that argument. You know, if if these are actually about kings and queens and heroes and princesses that lived thousands of years ago, if the myths are about that, which is what we're usually taught, then they're not really that useful to us, except as well that, you know, it's inspiration and, and that's wonderful. And I wish I could be like Hercules and be strong and fearless, or I wish I could be like Solomon and be wise. But, you know, that was Solomon. But if actually the story of Solomon is actually about you, then that's, then that's much more applicable. Now, I'm not saying that the goddess Artemis is you. Um, actually, I would argue that those powers are part of the universe, like the god of the ocean. Sure. Poseidon. Um, but our, it's our subconscious that we've been disconnected from. And I would argue that our subconscious is actually way more connected to the universe than we think it is. I mean, it's weird, but people can have connections with their subconscious to another person across town and they both go to a party and they end up wearing the same thing. And you're like, right. how did that happen? Um, that was weird. Or someone will get a message or a, a premonition about a friend or a relative or a loved one who's a whole continent away. And it happens to them at the middle of the night at 3 a.m. They wake up with a start and they get this premonition and they later find out that at 3 a.m. something was going on. This has happened over and over to people. How is that happening? Because our subconscious is actually connected to, to much more than what our conscious, our little conscious mind is, is paying attention to. And I feel like metaphor kind of works a little bit on a, on a subconscious uh, level as well, right? So that's kind of... That's a great oh, insight. That's a great yeah. insight. So that's, I think that's why the myths are doing this. And that's why Mr. Miyagi was teaching Danielson that way. Because what split us apart from our self, from our subconscious? What causes us anxiety? It's that little, it's that like spider web or that spider that you built over time in your brain of, oh, I need to do this in this situation. Or in this situation, that guy outranks me, you know, in the army. So I have to salute, you know, how many feet away should I, I was in the army. So I went through a lot of, um, you know, this kind of like gauging and measuring and judging and you develop all these judgments in your brain and they're useful for situations like driving a car you have to know who gets to go first at the stop sign right those are all conventions that are important but all those little judgments um, distract you from your subconscious is actually taking in all kinds of data from your gut from your you know oh, yeah. your skin from your your fascia network that's around all your muscles and from your organs, your subconscious is actually aware of all that, but your little uh, conscious brain that's paying attention to who gets to go first at this stop sign is too distracted. Oh, well, yeah. your, your subconscious is also tied into somehow to the wider universe. I don't understand how to where it sometimes gets those messages in the middle of the night, or sometimes you wake up in the morning and you have this um, thought that comes to you from a dream or something and you're like well my conscious mind didn't give me that it obviously unless it come from my subconscious so i think those tying into the powers of the universe like when odysseus gets a message from athena the goddess or from hermes the god hermes the messenger mm. hermes isn't necessarily odysseus but he's tapping into the universes Same. out there yeah and it's like that you're getting it's almost like a, like the receptors, like the smell receptors or something, you know, when a molecule has a receptor and then there's a similar molecule that right. also interacts with that. It's, those are like kind of the myths. And then we have like these receptors mm -hmm. that then they they kind of all fit in the same way. Right. Right. And so and so your observation. Yeah, it's like it's like, um, yeah, it fits into a, a, a it evokes it like like you said. The evocation, it's like the, the molecules go, oh, yeah, this is something a fit. there. And it's and, not quite and, in words or it's and, not quite explainable, but there's something that bypasses that little 
the words part, right? It bypasses the the part of your brain that's always thinking and judging and assessing and yeah. rationally trying to weigh this versus that or future, past. It's living in the past. It's living in the future instead sort of being beyond language present. altogether. It's beyond. Right. Yeah. And that's why Mr. Miyagi had to do that with daniel son because otherwise if he just started showing daniel son blocks and kicks yeah. daniel's brain would have been like uh wait a minute would that really work hold on i'm thinking about oh tonight i have to have a date with you know it's her face ally yeah or and and but maybe johnny's going to try and beat me up and he's not paying attention but when mr miyagi uses the metaphor of paint the fence or the, the all of a sudden a different part of daniel son is engaged and his his little you know his lower self is kind of starting to go to sleep and then the the message can seep in and the same i think the myths are doing the same thing so that was a great observation that you made so let me show you um so this is one example let me show you another one which i already yeah. accidentally flipped ahead to but you can see this is from an artist who lived from 1588 to 1617 so this was probably painted in the late 1500s or probably more likely early 1600s. This is a depiction of a god who slays a dragon, or at least defeats a dragon. Uh, it's a depiction, you, I'll just tell you who it is, it's Apollo. I don't know if you've ever heard of the story of Apollo fighting Python. Maybe a long time ago, but I forget, yeah. Yeah, so the oracle at Delphi, oracle, what's an oracle? An oracle is where you get messages from the, the realm of the gods, right, the realm of the gods. The oracle at Delphi was sacred to Apollo, and it was actually, that Delphi was in use all the way, you know, from hundreds of years B.C. all the way up until about 400 A.D. when the Romans started to become officially Christian. That's when they shut it down. But anyway, the legend of uh, uh, the oracle at Delphi was originally there was a serpent named the python or a dragon called the python and then apollo came along and drove it down you know drove the python down into a crack in the underneath delphi and the the poisonous gases or the gases emanating from the breath of the dragon still seeped up and that's what the the priestess who sat over that um you know crack chasm that would go down into the mountain we get these visions because of the gases that were emanating up from the python was supposedly still down there and some people say oh it, you know python was a feminine entity and apollo comes along this was like the patriarchal um mm. you know patriarchal myths dominating the the previous matriarchal i don't know if that's true or not but i do know that this whole story can be shown can be mapped to the constellations so um, look at the outline of Apollo again. Look at how he's holding the bow. Look at. Yep. Uh, an engraving, I guess. Look at the way that the artist has depicted the hand of Apollo there. Remember that little um, plume at the top of the constellation? Mm -hmm. and, and then we go back to the... And look at how he's kind of walking in one direction and looking in another direction. That's yes. a really common, common pattern of, of a Sagittarius figure. In the Bible, the story of Lot's wife remember lot was not supposed they had to leave sodom and gomorrah i don't know if you remember the story of what happened to lot's wife do you remember no i don't okay they were told look you've been living here in sodom and gomorrah but the uh they're going to be destroyed by fire and brimstone raining down from the heavens right. so you must not look back do not look back ah uh, right better not look back so Lot and his daughters flee without looking back, but Lot's wife, she can't help it. She has to look back. And you remember what happens to her? Fire and brimstone. <laughs> well, the fire and brimstone come down and she sees it coming down. I actually have a picture of it, but um, she's turned into a pillar of salt. 
Oh, okay. which is pretty horrible. Uh, I remember this story as a child. It's a little bit disturbing. You know, yeah. she's turned into a pillar of salt. And I had a picture book that actually showed her looking back and turning into a picture a pillar of salt. Right. Well, walking in one direction and looking back the other direction is a characteristic of Sagittarius. That's Lot's wife as well. The fire and brimstone is the Milky Way. Yeah. Obviously, the Milky Way is not a dark cloud. It's bright. And everything that's light in this picture is pitch black. And everything that's little black dots, those are little stars that are obviously glowing. So um, that fire and brimstone raining down is what Lot's wife is looking back at. And that's when she becomes a pillar of salt. But in this, what's really fascinating to me about this um, picture from the 15, late 15, early 1600s is it's not just Sagittarius and Scorpio. You can see that the dragon corresponds to Scorpio. Scorpio very often plays a dragon in the Bible and in other myths uh, from ancient Greece and other cultures, Norse myths. Mm -hmm. Look at above the dragon. Do you see a uh, mountain? Yeah, this mountain with a castle or a village or something on top yeah. there. Right. Look at above Scorpio. You see the constellation Ophiuchus? It's not a constellation that a lot of people are really familiar with. It's an extremely mythologically important constellation, and it plays a mountain in many ancient myths. Oh, okay. So you see how the artist has put a mountain right above the dragon? Yeah, that's kind of uh, undeniable that there's a... Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of undeniable. And do you right. see that the artist has also put something, a little terrain feature in between... Yes. The archer and the dragon. Right. Well, so the Milky Way, that's the Milky Way. It runs in between Sagittarius and Scorpio. Sure, there's a whole path leading back to that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a, it's, I think it's a river, I think is what he's trying to show. And he's putting oh, okay. like a crocodile or something in the river oh, there. Oh, yeah, I didn't see that. Yeah. Kind of interesting. Um, but that river, that's the Milky Way. So this artist, whether he knows it or not, is depicting a celestial scene here. There's Sagittarius. That's correct. Apollo corresponds to Sagittarius. He's slaying the dragon that corresponds to Scorpio. We've got the mountain right above. We've got the stream right there. This is a pattern that we'll find in the myths over and over around the world. So there are figures who fight serpents or dragons in myths around the world. Here's a different figure. This is can you see the ancient artist has actually told us who this is, but it's someone who's wielding a thunderbolt. So you can probably figure out which God that would be. Uh, Zeus. Yes. And it actually says Zeus. That's an S I think. And that's a Z, <laughs> but that's Zeus. And he is fighting a creature named Typhon, Typhon. And Typhon, uh, in this ancient, this is a, a vase that someone has, uh, Someone has drawn, this goes all the way, this is like a wraparound picture, but <clears throat> it's not in black and white in the original. This is an artistic rendition of what is on the vase. But Typhon has been depicted as someone with wings and kind of like serpents down beneath. That's interesting. And Zeus is not in the same posture that we saw for Sagittarius with um, Artemis and Apollo. So let me show you the constellations again that we just had on that last scene we had a sagittarius figure fighting a dragon but now we have a hercules figure you see that yeah so this is the outline of hercules once again h.a ray this is h.a ray's outlines if you go on wikipedia or your iphone you're going to get you're likely to get some terrible outline of the stars of hercules that will not help you see the connection at all but H.A. Ray is like the Rosetta Stone he I don't know how but his outline of, of Hercules is the right outline to match up so look at the deep knee bend look at the heel that's raised right here we got one arm distinctly reaching forward one arm distinctly reaching forward there on Zeus to touching the wing of Typhon and then over his head he's brandishing the most irresistible, powerful weapon in the whole Greek myth, mythology, 
the thunderbolt weapon. So Hercules in the sky has this enormous, looks like it could be a sword, could be a scimitar, could be a club, uh, could be a lot of weapons. But sometimes it's usually the most power, whichever god is wielding the most powerful weapon usually corresponds to Hercules. And if it's a thunderbolt weapon, you can almost be positive that it corresponds to Hercules. Or Her Heracles, as you said earlier, Heracles is the Greek name. We yeah. call the constellation Hercules. I'm not talking about the hero Hercules right now. I'm talking about the constellation that we sure. call Hercules. The hero Heracles or Hercules also happens to correspond to this same constellation. He's the son of Zeus. So well, that makes sense. Zeus is this constellation. His son Hercules or Heracles is also this constellation. Hercules carries around a club. He usually has a lion skin over his head to make his head look kind of square. Mm. Hercules usually has what kind of beard? A little goatee or a full-on square beard? He's got the full-on square. Well, what, look at this constellation in the sky. That's Why does Hercules have a full-on square beard? Because of the constellation, it's I would hipster, argue. that's why. <laughs> well, that too. But Zeus also has a big square beard, right? Right. Hmm. Yeah. Not, not necessarily in this picture. He's got a little bit of pointy action going on. Yeah, there, but, but you can still see it's got the jaw. It's a full Even beard, picture, yeah. It's got the jawline and all that. Definitely turns the corner there, right? So, yeah. And you can't deny that that is Zeus in the posture that matches up with Hercules. So who's Typhon in this case? Well, I would argue that he's got features of Ophiuchus and Scorpio down below. Hmm. So, so you can see that we have different gods will fight a Scorpio figure, usually a dragon type figure. Actually, in the story of Zeus and Typhon, you may not be as familiar with the story, but how Zeus defeats Typhon is he actually throws a mountain on top of Typhon. <laughs> okay. Because Typhon is really powerful. Zeus is throwing thunderbolts at him and it's not killing him. And he says, well, if I can't kill him, I'll trap him underneath a mountain. And he throws a huge mountain down on top of Typhon. And the legend is that that is Mount Etna. Well, Mount Etna is a big volcano in Italy. So even today, that Mount Etna erupts periodically. Um, I wrote a blog post about it when it erupted most recently, a couple, like a year ago. And I said the story of Zeus putting a mountain on top of Typhon relates to the stars. And that's why, so that's why the mountain erupts periodically, because Typhon's not dead. He's under there spewing forth lava every now and then, but he's trapped under the mountain. Well, right. can you see a, a mountain-shaped figure? Yeah, we, right on we, top of him. <laughs> we already said that Ophiuchus often plays a mountain in various myths around the world. Here we have Zeus slamming a mountain down on top of a dragon-like figure. So are there other patterns around the world where a powerful god or goddess will slay a dragon-like figure? Answer is yes. They're all over. I've got I've got lots of them. This is an interesting one. This is the god Krishna from ancient India. This is actually from a temple in uh, Thailand. Krishna defeats a serpent who's called the Kaliya Nag. Kaliya Nag, a five-headed kind of cobra serpent. The Kaliya Nag is. Um, is this big giant, you know, five-headed cobra? Well, Krishna is being depicted in this. This is at Muang Tom. It's in Thailand. It's about two hours from Bangkok. It's a really uh, uh, old temple from about the 11th century AD from the Khmer Empire, I believe. But you can see that the outline of Krishna in this depiction where he's defeating the Kaliya Nag has the same... Look at, he's holding apart the, the cobra heads with this foot and this foot. Just and the like, legs, yeah, the ankle. The legs, the legs are exactly. Are very, very, again, not the natural way that the, the legs would be depicted. Right. It was a photo or something. Right. And I would argue that uh, the Kaliya Nag is the Scorpio. This isn't actually how H.A. Uh, Ray depicts Scorpio a little differently than I do. Mm -hmm. I usually um, put the multiple heads because in so many myths, Scorpio will play a many-headed dragon or a many-headed serpent, just like here in the Kalianag. Um, but Krishna dancing on the uh, Kalianag, 
they actually reenact this every year in India. Um, they have, you know, a member of the community plays Krishna and dances on top of the head of a giant uh, statue of a cobra. I would argue that Krishna is usually actually identified with Ophiuchus. That's why he's standing right on top of Scorpio. But obviously this uh, artist from the 11th century has clearly drawing of Thor who's fighting. Do you know who his mortal enemy is? Uh, Thor Ragnarok. No, that's not it. Yeah, that's... in Ragnarok, he uh, he encounters this dreaded serpent. I forget the uh, name. It's, it's the Midgard serpent. The okay. Midgard serpent. It's not in the, uh, I don't think the Marvel uh, Thor Ragnarok. You don't have that part? Yeah, yeah. yeah they, they had, uh, you know, uh, Kate Blanchett instead, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. fighting fighting Thor. But uh, this is a, a famous episode from Norse myths where Thor goes fishing and he actually dredges up the Midgard serpent. But um, the the Jotun that he's going fishing with gets frightened and cuts the line right when Thor was about to throw his hammer at the Midgard serpent. And Thor was angry at the Jotun for doing that because he wanted to fight the Midgard serpent right then and there and get it over with. But in Ragnarok, they meet again. Anyway, Thor is a thunder god. Zeus is a thunder god. Zeus has the most powerful weapon in the, all of the Greek myths. Who do you think has the most powerful weapon in all of the Norse myths? Thor. <laughs> Thunderbolt weapon. Thunderbolt, it's a, yeah. In this case, it's a hammer. But you can see that the artists, you know, in this wonderful book from the 1960s have some lightning coming out of the hammer. But Thor fighting the Midgard Serpent is another example of a Hercules figure. Thor clearly corresponds to Hercules. And, and I argue that in a book uh, that I published last year called Star Mist, Volume 4, Norse Mythology. So we, we ended, we were talking about Thor, but that's not the only one. If you go around the world, there's a... Uh, there's figures who battle with serpent-like creatures. Even in the myths of the Pacific, the god Maui, this is not a picture of Maui, this is a diver, but he's encountering a giant moray eel. You see that moray eel? <laughs> oh, uh, it might have to share the screen again, I think. Oh, I didn't share the screen, no. I didn't do it right. Hold on. Yep, there we go. Get me out of there, yep. That's a pretty large eel. <laughs> so oh, yeah. in the myths of Maui, there's an even bigger eel. There's a giant eel. It's like a, a you know, monster eel whose name is Tuna, and Maui has to fight Tuna. So it's another example of the same pattern, like Thor fights the Midgard Serpent, Apollo fights Python, Zeus fights Typhon, mm -hmm. um, you know, Heracles fights the Hydra. Remember the Lernaean Hydra? Maui fights this great giant eel called tuna. And the eel is like even bigger than this eel because Maui, I think, surfs on, uh, you know, surfs on a stone and hits the eel in the head. And that's how the eel dies. And then he buries his skull. And there's all these, uh, this is like a giant eel. But there's even in the Bible, um, click here. Oh, well, here we have in the Mesoamerica, this is a, a Maya codex from Central America. Mm -hmm. And we have a figure carrying a thunderbolt weapon. This is a god in a Maya codex. Can you see that it's the exact same pattern? Yeah, yeah. The, Look at that. Yeah. He's got the same deep knee bend that we identified with the constellation Hercules. Right. There's Hercules. The same thunderbolt weapon. I mean, they've even depicted the thunderbolt weapon in very similar ways. But I don't think this ancient Greek artist and this ancient Central American artist ever had any contact with one or another. Skyping with each other, or no. So I think that these myths come from 
a system that's even older. And that's why, you know, I'm talking about this and the evidence is overwhelming, but you won't hear this in a university because the implications are so um, destructive to the paradigm that we have. It's like Graham Hancock's work. The, 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 or Robert Schock and John Anthony West, when, when they started talking about the uh, Sphinx being so much older, the academic, the academic community was not open to that at all. They were literally, uh, you know, insulting them and making fun of that theory. But this is undeniable evidence, I would argue. Anyway, I also uh, have lots of pictures of, this is also in the Bible, the uh, fighting a dragon. This is the figure of Michael. The archangel Michael fights a dragon in the book of Revelation, chapter 12. Right. He defeats a dragon. This is a pretty interesting one. The dragon like has a face on his stomach and a face here. But notice that in each of these pictures, the Archangel Michael has wings, is usually using a spear, mm -hmm. and is carrying something in his other hand. Do you see what he's carrying in his other hand? Uh, I can't quite tell what that it's is. hard to see, but these are scales. Or balances. Oh, oh yes. Kind of okay. Holding it is like, there's the crossbar, and the, this is one balance. This is the other balance. That's a very common thing for Michael to be carrying in his other hand. Here's a spear pointing down at the dragon. Here's the balances. In this case, the balance has two people. One's oh, wow, happy. Yeah. One's not so happy. The balance the on this. Scales are Libra. Is Libra the? Well, very. Yeah, you're 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 exactly right. So, but you can see this. This end of the scale, the the person in the scale is not happy because the demon has him. This side of the scale is being helped up by what I would say, I would suggest is probably a Sagittarius figure. But um, here's another Michael. You same here's angle. Same, yeah, yeah, same. And here we have scale. scales with people in them. And now I'll bring in the... I would argue that Michael is an Ophiuchus figure. Ophiuchus figures are almost always carrying a spear, which is because of these, you can draw a line through these stars. There's the spear going down into okay. Scorpio. And, you see that? Yeah, and you have Libra there on the right. There's Libra right there. That's the scales. Hmm. That's why St. Michael is so often carrying a scale while slaying the dragon with a spear and the dragon gets depicted in all these different ways but usually michael is standing on the dragon if you were to rewind to all those other pictures you would see that michael was standing on the dragon because ophiuchus is standing on scorpio you see that yeah yeah hmm. it's, it's just like in the book of genesis in chapter verse 3 chapter 3 verse 16 where eve is told the serpent, the, the child of the serpent will bite your descendant, will step on his, crush his head, but he will bite, bruise his heel. That's Ophiuchus standing on Scorpio, if you're familiar with that verse. You can look it up, Genesis 3.16. It's talking about the relationship between Ophiuchus and Scorpio. Here's one more. In this case, um, Michael has a sword, pretty long sword, but not a spear, but still has the scales. The reason I showed this one is not only standing on the dragon, but the dragon has multiple heads, just right. like just like Scorpio. I mean, hmm. and that's in Revelation 12. Um, well, this you have the you have a village in the background there too. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah, a hill actually, a, hill a wooded the, yeah. a wooded wooded mountain. So that pattern is very common. Hmm. And even even in uh, the book of Isaiah, it talks about the Lord fighting against Leviathan. So that's another figure, a, a God fighting against a dragon. In fact, the, uh, the text itself says, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Remember the constellation Scorpio is in the Milky Way. It's partly in the Milky Way. And actually this is a really interesting word. This word piercing, see, I put this up here because this is a text. People yeah. might say, oh, well, all those pictures. Yeah, of course, the artists were looking at the stars, so they just worked that in. That doesn't mean that the myths are actually based on the stars. Well, that's just visual evidence that's easy to show people. 
I could go through the actual myths and show that they match up with the stars. This is a text from Isaiah that matches up with the stars. The Lord with a sore and great and strong sword. Remember, I mean, this is like piling on adjectives about how big and strong the sword is, just like the constellation Hercules. Punish Leviathan, that piercing serpent. That word piercing, if you look it up actually in Hebrew, is a, is a word that it means a fugitive, the serpent, as fleeing, and the constellation by that name. It also means crooked and piercing. Here's from Genesius's, Jacenius's Hebrew lexicon, or Chaldean lexicon, fugitive, an epi this word relates also to a constellation and a fleeing serpent, which is what Scorpio looks like in the sky. Wow. This is textual evidence. This is not just artistic evidence. And actually, this, um, this word, bariach, is actually Strong's H1281. And it's referring back to H1272. This gets a little technical, but H1272 is a related word. This is barak. Barak means to flee, but it also means to break through, to cut through, to cut across or break out of, which is what Scorpio is actually doing in the sky, out, is breaking out of the Milky Way. You see how Scorpio yeah. is cutting through, breaking through? That's the piercing serpent. They used a very unusual word in the Hebrew text itself that refers to a fleeing serpent or one that's piercing through. And there's the great and sore and strong and powerful sword mm -hmm. fighting against the Leviathan. That that's in the sea. He shall slay the dragon that's in the sea. The sea in this case. Yeah, it's yeah, it makes it makes a lot of so, sense. I mean, it's right there. So anyway, I just wanted to show you some things that maybe I haven't shown on some other uh, podcasts, but to mm. really try and drive home the the evidence is overwhelming. This just scratches the surface. It's just um, I'm going to unshare here and we can we can finish up and, you know, any questions that you have. I'm sorry if I. <laughs> yeah, no, that's OK. I, I, I recognize that it does. It does take a while to, to get the, the point across, kind of, because if you just show one or two, it doesn't quite it doesn't quite get people thinking, the, the, seeing the big picture that there's so many, uh, you know, layers upon layers to this, to this thing. Um, and it's worldwide. It's not just and it localized, connects yeah. all the myths. It shows that the you know, the the biblical the people who are going around and trying to stamp out uh, other myths using the bible are really making a bad mistake because they're all built on the same system and they're all actually talking about how we can get back in touch with our higher self that we that was lost i have this I'll just finish with, I'm going to show you this picture real quick. Okay. Um, this is a picture from uh, a statue from ancient Egypt. And you see the the god Horus is, is kind of behind and above the pharaoh's head. This is a statue that is uh, a likeness of Kepren or Khafra, to whom the second pyramid at Giza is usually attributed. But that's a really powerful image to me of like our higher self, getting in touch with your higher self. That's what these myths, all these myths about twins are not really about two different figures. There's all these twins like Eros and Psyche. Psyche is a human woman whose name happens to be Psyche. Well, what's that telling you? It's talking about our own Psyche and she has to get back in touch she loses connection with Eros, the god that's her beloved, um, and then she has to search for him again. Or um, the story of Osiris, and he's you know lost, and then Isis has to look for him. Or doubting Thomas, when Thomas is reconciled with Jesus, I believe that's a picture of us becoming reintegrated with our higher self. 
just like that picture that I was showing. I think in the in the Vedic stuff that it's Atman and Brahman, right? And they talk about it being two birds clasped to the same tree. That's one of the concepts, like the higher self and the and the individual self. Right, Atman and Brahman is one, uh, you know, one way of expressing it. And they, uh, I mean, it's very deep. And this goes obviously oh, yeah. very deep. I, 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 I'm not doing justice to say that's one way of expressing it, but. That I believe that's what's going on. And also Krishna and Arjun in the Mahaparat. Arjun is this hero who's semi-divine, just like Gilgamesh is a hero who's semi-divine. And Arjun has to participate in this great battle, which is a metaphor for our struggle in this incarnate life. But he has a divine charioteer, Krishna. So there's actually... Um, in the Mahaparat is this big epic, this Sanskrit epic. That's all based on the stars as well. It's actually 7.2 times longer than the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. It's this wonderful epic, mm. but it's but it's all these metaphors and pictures of this these same myths that actually apply to us. It's not just about heroes and goddesses and princesses that lived thousands of years ago. If it were, that wouldn't be as relevant as i believe it's a picture of how we can become reconnected so atman and brahman but also krishna and arjun or um you know all these different uh twins around the world um it is a pattern that's talking about our own need to get there is usually a divine twin and a mortal twin sure i mean the We've talked about this on this podcast here and there, but I feel like um, when people say, like, you know, what, what are the chances that um, all these various religions around the world, um, that one of them is right and that the other ones are all completely wrong because they're obviously in conflict, conf confliction with one another as far as the, if you look at it literally. Um, but if you look at it the way that you're explaining it, it's much higher of a chance of, of, of something that's realistic that... that um, there's a common thread between all these myths and the origin of them and sort of the esoteric meaning and that through history, like you mentioned, they, they've been sort of gobbled up or, or stamped out and sort of been superseded by other more powerful institutions. And the, well, just, it, yeah, you know. or taken literally like the, the myths of the Bible, I believe are teaching these same profound truths, but, but they've been turned into something different. So um, I believe that all of them are true all around the world, but they can certainly be twisted and they can be turned into actually meaning the opposite of what they were, what I would argue they were intended to mean. But, but yeah, that's, I mean, that, but the fact that they're all connected and they're all using the stars argues that they all came from, there's some kind of family tree that goes back even before I would, I would argue the most likely explanation is there's some lost civilization or lost culture that was destroyed, just like Graham Hancock talks about in his latest book, America Before. It's fantastic. Um, and I got a chance to hear him present in person in San Mateo, my hometown. Um, and, and the things that, he, that he's talking about, about a lost civilization and a cataclysm, I believe that th this myth evidence also supports that there was some sort of cat possibly some sort of terrible cataclysm and then the myths are a survival of some even more ancient source that predates ancient egypt and, and is really predates ancient mesopotamia is is possibly so far before ancient egypt that it's as far before ancient egypt as ancient egypt is before where we are in time right now right, right. like gobekli tepe so, or before Gobekli Tepe. So, um, yeah, it's it's really fascinating, and it and it is pretty vast. But hopefully, I'm trying to tie it into something that's practical. You know, when I'm talking about it and talking about your higher self, I think tying it into these problems that we're facing, and it gets into the economics. We don't have time to go sure. into yeah, maybe that's for the next and, and why it's so wrong. But uh, <laughs> but maybe another time we can. But sure. um, but that's tied into it too, because I think the uh, you know the the gods work their way out through 
men and women. So putting down men and women uh, or, or, or debasing or, or tyrannizing or oppressing them is a grave affront to the gods who, you know, every single person that you ever meet has this divine spark inside. That's what the myths are talking about. For and, sure. and, and, uh, you know, taking away the resources that are given by the gods to one, you know, group of people for all those people, those, those people were allowed to be born in that country by, you know, the Greeks believe that the goddess Artemis was present at every birth, maybe, you know, a different goddess in different parts of the world. But the, the message is that every baby is a gift from the gods, right? Or, or right. Uh, see, it's like a, a goddess is present at the birth of every single child, right? So the people that were allowed to be born in that country you can't just come in and take away their oil or their, uh, you know, copper or their, th those, those things that are under the earth were seen as being, um, in the realm of the gods, like the God Pluto or Hades was the God who owned all the wealth that was under the surface, all the gold, all the silver. So, so to go and steal the gifts of the gods to one people or another, is a terrible affront, you know, to the gods. Anyway, I, you know, and so it can tie back into the economics of what's going on right now, um, as well. But I don't want yeah, to. Yeah, we'll leave it for, for part three <laughs> of our uh... cans of worms. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, well, I want to thank you again for uh, joining us on the podcast. Again, obviously, this stuff is very deep, and if people want to look up more of your stuff, of course, it's the David Matheson Corollary. The Matheson Corollary, and then the StarMythWorld.com. Um, they could find your books and that through through that website, correct? Yeah, everything's there. Everything's yep. there, and then you can find me on YouTube too. There's there's several video videos that I make uh, from time to time. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks again, man. Good luck in the in the NBA Finals, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll do our part three uh, sometime down the line for sure. Yeah. Thanks, Derek, and best wishes with the podcast. Thanks for inviting me on, and it was a pleasure talking with you. Always. Okay. Take care, man.